So welcome back to Ancient Literature, the final video of the year. Congratulations on making it this far, guys. It's pretty crazy um, and also very impressive. Uh, so I'm hoping to Zoom with some of you as opposed to none of you today. You can watch this video before or after the meeting, which makes things a little temporally confusing in terms of uh, uh, where you guys are in relation to that. But I know not everyone can make that, so it kind of has to be technically optional. But hopefully some of you can stop by real quick so we can wrap things up. Um, all right, let's talk about the last little bit of this play, uh, except the very last bit, which we will read in the Zoom meeting. Um, or maybe we already read it. Who knows? Okay, so what we see at the end of Act 4 and Act 5 as well is the continuation of of Brutus kind of having to confront and being made to confront essentially doubt, uh, which that is the ultimate defeat for Brutus, right? We kind of were like hinting at this in Monday's video uh, when he was having that argument with Cassius, but you know, Brutus dying or his side losing ultimately maybe isn't even the worst fate that Brutus could have. I, I think it, Shakespeare makes it kind of clear via implication or outright um, explicit uh, language that Brutus confronting the fact that he may have made a mistake is what is ultimately going to do in Brutus uh, that that will, that will lead to his downfall and essentially is is his downfall. So at the end of Act Four, he sees this ghost. They leave it really vague, but uh, it doesn't even need to be a ghost that resembles Julius Caesar perfectly. It's going to act on the latent or uh, very present guilt that Brutus apparently seems to have. So Brutus hears this guy playing some tune and it starts to sound dreamlike uh, and, he, and he tells him to, to knock it off and suddenly this ghost appears. How ill this taper burns! Who comes here? I think it is the weakness of mine eyes that shapes this monstrous apparition. It comes upon me. Art thou anything? Art thou some god, some angel, or some devil that makest my blood cold and my hair to stare? Speak to me. So he doesn't even, he's not immediately like, oh, it's Caesar. The ghost says, thy evil spirit, Brutus. Uh, why comest thou? To tell thou shalt see me at Philippi. Oh, Julius Caesar, thou art mighty yet. And so it, it dawns on him, or at least in his own mind, he accepts that this is Julius Caesar. Look at that amazing William Blake painting. It's a uh, 17th century uh, artist uh, living in the time a little bit after... Uh, Julius Caesar, and he depicts a lot of stuff from Paradise Lost as well. It's just such a weird style. I like the other one too uh, as well, but that one's just like weird. Um, okay, so this is a finale, Act 5. Cassius and Brutus uh, ultimately decide um, to be uh, proactive, and so they decide to confront Octavian and Antony's forces head on as opposed to uh, delay this, um, this fight. Uh, and this is historical. Mark Anthony kind of forced them into uh, a couple of bad options right at the end of this uh, campaign. And th the fact that they ultimately kind of uh, uh, decide to move forward with everything and not just kind of delay and run uh, mirrors the, the their, their original decision to carry out the assassination. Uh, so say what you will about Cassius and Brutus, but they, they aren't running from things, necessarily. Um, they've made their bed, and so they are lying at it in it at this point. Uh, at the beginning of this scene, Octavius and uh, Antony trade barbs, which is kind of a funny idea. Uh, or, I'm sorry, Antony and Cassius. Um, they have this moment where they're, they're speaking to one another. And yeah, they, they just have like a, a diss match here. Um, Anthony makes fun of them for kind of groveling at Caesar to delay him when... They were uh, just about to assassinate him, and Cassius says, oh, you're one to, to speak, um, given that, you know, Anthony is such a um, uh, such a flatterer himself, or he was, to uh, Julius Caesar. And then we just get more and more of these portents and omens, which are uh, two different words for the same thing, but these are bad omens, especially for Brutus, uh, and they just start piling up. First, it's the fight with Cassius, then it's the news of Cicero, then it's the ghost, which is hitting the nail on the head, and then it's the fact that they're forced into this difficult battle. Uh, and we have this strange episode that probably really threw you guys for a loop a little bit, uh, wherein we have this char 
character Titinius, who maybe just kind of made your eyes gloss over a little bit, and you were just like, who the heck is this? Why should I care? He was mentioned very briefly by Cassius back in Act 2, in an anecdote, a flashback, uh, to when Cassius was talking about Julius Caesar being sick, and he had Titinius fetch uh, water for him. It was a very minor detail, but it just shows that Titinius, just like Brutus and Cassius, were at one, or was at one time, a friend of Caesar's. Weren't we all, though? Uh, and, and now he's come to this. And so Titinius, who happens to be a really good friend of Cassius's, has this uh, strange and, and tragic episode where um, we have Cassius asking this guy, Pindarus, to report on Titinius uh, going out into the battle. Pindarus misreports the death of Titinius. He mistakes him for somebody else. And so Cassius takes it really hard and, as I say in the note, pulls a full Romeo and then I guess that makes Titinius Juliet because in the in the, uh, the the screenshot to the right, Titinius comes back, find out that Cassius has freaked out and overreacted, and so he does what Cassius did too. So this is one of those just like almost cartoonishly tragic and over the top uh, Romeo and Juliet style double deaths but this is actually pretty typical for shakespearean tragedies right this is a tragedy so whether it's hamlet or macbeth or julius caesar or even some of his romance romantic tragedies like romeo and juliet uh we often end up with a body count at the end um and so this doesn't even go back to julius i mean uh, to romeo and juliet which shakespeare would have already written um that play itself was inspired by this thousand year old or well, yeah, at that time it was about 1,500 years old, um, myth, or more, uh, called Pyramus and Thisbe, about these two young Greek teenagers who do pretty much exactly what Romeo and Juliet did. Uh, and this is just, uh, I mean, A, this is a way that Cassius meets his end, and um, which is historical. We don't know if it was because he thought his friend had died, but um, uh, he, he does die before Brutus, and um, so it's a way for Shakespeare to, to make that happen, and it's also a way to just just have tragedy upon tragedy happen to this faction, Brutus and Cassius's faction. So if you see there at the bottom middle column, uh, Cassius gets a little um, poetic about about his choice. Stand not to answer here, take thou this hilt, and when thy face is covered as tis now, guide thou sword. So Pindarus helps him out with this and doesn't seem to mind. Uh, I, I'm just, I, it's kind of unclear. I don't think this would have been an accurate thing for a Roman to do. Maybe a Greek soldier from like hundreds of years before this battle was historically taking place. But if I, if, I guess if Cassius is telling you to do something, and and you're you're his soldier, you're gonna obey. Um, and so Caesar, thou art revenged even with the sword that killed thee. Yeah, pretty epic. Pretty epic. I agree. Uh, and, and I guess tragic. I don't know if we ever liked Cassius. Brutus, there, there, it seemed like there was some virtue there, some some real ethical uh, heft. Uh, but Cassius, uh, he started to kind of look more and more like maybe he swayed or even manipulated Brutus at this point. And then we have the last straw for Marcus Brutus. So I'm going to go clockwise here. Uh, Brutus finds out about Cassius. He gets uh, kind of driven away from the battle. It's pretty clear at this point that they are going to lose. This is historical. Brutus just kind of wanders off into the, the Macedonian wilderness with a few legions left, knowing his fate at this point. Uh, and so I'll just read a little bit of this. We're, we're almost done. You'll never. Oh, I won't have to read much anymore after this. Um, are yet two Romans living such as these, the last of all Romans fare thee well? It is impossible that ever Rome should breed thy fellow. Friends, I owe more tears to this dead man than you shall see me pay. I shall find time, Cassius. I shall find time. So he does stick by Cassius until the end. He's not going to just say, oh, you know what? Cassius was a bad guy after all. Uh, it, Brutus is nothing without his principles. The principles that led him here, he's going to have to stick with those. That's the only way that he can have any semblance of... Uh, confidence in, in what he's done. Uh, it's, it's, you know, like, this is how else is he gonna hold his head high as a Roman? Um, so let's see, he tells this guy, uh, Volumnius, the ghost of Caesar hath appeared to me two several times by night at Sardis once, and this off screen last night here in Philippi Fields. I know my hour has come. He's accepted 
his resignation, or he has resigned to acceptance. Farewell to you, and to you, and you, Volumnia Strato, Strada, thou hast been all this while asleep. Farewell to thee too, Strato. Countrymen, my heart doth joy that yet in all my life I found no man, but he was true to me. I shall have glory by this losing day. This is important. More than Octavius and Mark Anthony, by this vile conquest shall attain unto. So fare you well at once, for Brutus's tongue hath almost ended his life's history. Night hangs upon mine eyes, my bones would rest. Thou have but labored to attain this honor. <laughs> Okay. Kind of epically tragic. Uh, yeah, I like Brutus. I don't know if you guys like Brutus, but uh, he's, he's a perfectly conflicted character. Very Hamlet-esque. Uh, and yet, the things he's dealing with are actually more weighty than Hamlet. He has the fate of a country resting on his shoulders. I guess you could say that about Hamlet. You guys haven't read Hamlet, so sorry. But, uh, but yeah, I, I like that he, he's able to claim this at the end. He says, at the very least, what I did is more glorious than Octavius and Mark Anthony. And, and that's something, you know, even if there's like a little bit of you know, deception or desperation in there, delusion, it's what he needs to feel like he he didn't just waste his uh, his shot. Um, all right. And and so this happens. He, he does his own Romeo and Juliet thing. Running on a sword is a, is a way of saying this. Uh, and, and yep, we have a, we have a full Hamlet situation here, guys. Spoiler, but Hamlet ends in an even, even more messed up way. And we will read the very last little bit. There's like a tiny little bit of dialogue. Uh, I'm not going to have you guys read, or have, I'm not going to have made you guys already read too much. Uh, but after this, we just have like a little exchange between Anthony and Octavian and like one other character. And that's about it. Um, so we're left without really an, an answer. Shakespeare is not basic enough to take a side here and tell us if Mark, uh, Marcus Junius Brutus is a hero, a martyr, or a traitor. Shakespeare would never uh, deign to be so straight ahead and, and reductive as that. Uh, but according to Brutus, he, he was a hero until the end. A martyr for the Republic, right? What he was doing was, was for this lofty ideal of essentially democracy and, and, and against monarchy. And, and I, that is admirable. Uh, hundreds of years after uh, this historically happens, Dante Alighieri will uh, depict Cassius and Brutus along with Cain, the, the original biblical sinner, in the mouth of the capital B beast himself. Uh, and this has a lot to do with the fact that Dante is working within the Catholic tradition that elevates Augustus to this lofty status as a very important figure and a kind of uh, proto-Christian figure, uh, even though he was pagan, one of these virtuous pagans, right? And thus, by extension, Julius Caesar is also important. Weirdly, though, I don't know if we would have ended up with Augustus if it weren't for Brutus and Cassius, right? Everything they did led to Augustus. They they were trying to buck against monarchy and empire and, and fight for the republic and, and senators and democracy and voting, essentially. Uh, and it, it just resulted in, you know, it took a couple decades, but it resulted in actual official empire with Augustus, right? Octavian becomes Augustus, just to, to remind you. Um, he is a, he goes from being uh, just the just the grand nephew of Julius Caesar, not a big deal, to being the heir, the, the godson, as it were, to to now being the, the successor and and the name or the uh, the kind of whole reason behind Virgil's epic that we read for most of this semester, right? And so to bring this full circle, no pun intended, what could we even think of this in terms of Campbell's circle? Uh, we used this a lot last semester, you know, less so for Iliad than Odyssey, and I don't think anybody would really try to take a Shakespeare play and force it into this uh, structure, but, um, uh, I mean, we essentially can't. The, it's, it's almost as though if your call to adventure is false, if perhaps Brutus was led astray by his ideals and by his friend Cassius, then he, he had a bad call to adventure that led him 
to the abyss, right, the belly of the beast, and he game over there. He didn't make it to the metamorphosis, to the meeting of the goddess, to the ultimate boon, to the reconciliation with the father. He didn't have the chance. In a way, maybe that was implied for him because he knew deep, deep down that what he did was well intended. But ultimately, he didn't make it back to the threshold. He didn't get to cross the threshold again, which is... Which is, you know, that brings us to the whole question that we left off on with Aeneas. So it's the same thing with Aeneas, where it's like, well, he did go on a hero's journey for sure, but did he come back to this threshold? Is is founding what will become Rome? Is that the threshold, even if it was it involved so much bloodshed? That is also unclear. And I'm going to link this New Yorker article, which is really, really long, and I, I doubt anyone's really going to like mess with it. But if you're if you're still kind of intrigued in how abrupt that ending was, and all of that pessimist versus optimist scholarship that I was talking about, it is worth a read. Essentially, at the end of the day, we don't know. We don't know if Virgil maybe did have this subversive bone in his body, actually, or if to him everything that happened that wasn't so great in the second half of the poem was just part of the glory that is eventually the Roman Empire. Uh, it's unclear, right? We just have to kind of shrug and say, well, you know, for at the time that it was written, it wasn't that. If that's what it is for us in modern times, and so be it. And maybe it's both. So the kind of thing I'm uh, sort of stealing and also kind of like adding to from that linked article is that Aeneas is neither a hero nor a bad guy. It's more rich than that. He's a survivor. I actually really like that from the article. The Trojans did what they must to survive, things both glorious and terrible, just like Brutus, just like Augustus, just like the wandering Trojans and Dido's Libyans. Uh, even Odysseus did the same. Uh, and that's relatable, if nothing else, for all humans on this planet, uh, to be broad. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Hail Caesar, right? For better or for worse. Well, anyway, guys, this class's curriculum is amazing. Uh, this is the first literature class I taught. I couldn't ask for a better group of kids or a better curriculum, better set of uh, poems and plays. Truly, like, honestly. Um, if you guys liked it, so I'm way too late with this, but if you if you found yourself like really actually liking the story of this play, but getting continually frustrated with the Shakespearean language, again, super, I don't know why I didn't remember this. This is a thing. Uh, this thing called No Fear Shakespeare, which is like a part of the Sparknotes website, uh, does this cool thing where it's like side by side. I mean, I think you guys probably already know about this. I, I knew about this when I was a student. I just like forgot. But but it is really cool. If you want to go through this play or any other Shakespeare plays, um, just in case you got bit by the Shakespeare bug at some point, um, and you're like, hey, this is actually kind of cool, but also it's, you know, it'd be kind of nice if I wasn't always kind of like thinking, like, I think I know what they were saying, but I don't totally know. Because, I mean, I'll be honest, that, that happens to me sometimes with these plays. Uh, but anyway, guys, uh, so I will either see you or I will have already seen you. And, by the way, the final, so the whole study guide is on the doc for today, or the, the form. Um, it'll be in a doc. If you have trouble downloading that or if you want to download it, uh, you can email me for a PDF. But you guys know the drill. These finals are never horrible. Try to have fun with the short answer. That's what I would say. Uh, and definitely don't like blow off looking at the multiple choice because uh, some of it goes back to like a couple months ago. So it is a little older. But yeah, I guess that is about it. And good luck with your finals. I'll probably see you guys around the, what, the, the first week of June. And then, and then who knows? But either way, signing off. Um... It's been real. You lose. You lose.